Hi, everyone. It's lovely to see you all again, and I appreciate you joining me. We'll be turning to architecture today, looking at some of the most basic building blocks, you might say, of architectural structure, and seeing how these elements are used in some of the greatest architectural works in the world. Now, just a note up front, I'm going to be referring to the designers of architecture as architects for the sake of simplicity. But keep in mind that the modern distinction between aesthetically focused architects and then mathematically oriented engineers is really a distinction that hasn't existed for most of human history. So the same architect of a church or a temple could also be responsible for creating siege weapons, for example. Now, both architects and engineers are constantly having to negotiate between the ideal and the real. That is, how do they get what they want and need in a building while still working within the confines of physical reality? And this tension or constant negotiation is what I personally find the most interesting part of architecture. So you have to consider what is the activity? What's the purpose of the building? What is the space going to be used for? How large does it have to be? Does there need to be some sort of symbolism or meaning behind it? And how should it look? And on the other hand, you're balancing that with limitations of materials, both the availability of materials and then also what uh, the materials themselves are capable of. You have the limitation of time. How much time are you able to devote to this project? How quickly does it need to be completed? And then the energy, the um, labor energy required to produce it. Uh, the skill that is available. If you have no skilled craftsmen available, you're going to be much more limited in what you can construct than if you do have very skilled workers. <laughs> now, fundamentally, architecture is about the attempt to enclose space while negotiating the laws of physics. The key to this lies in the building structure. It's skeleton, you might say. And the parts that are actually doing the work of bearing loads and spanning space and undergoing tension, compression, and stress. Of all the forms of art, architecture is the slowest to change. One of the reasons for this is the avoidance of risky investments. Every architectural project requires that a significant chunk of resources be diverted to that project and away from other things. And that kind of resource dedication tends to discourage significant experimentation. A lot of societies aren't able to afford that kind of cost. They may not have a lot of resources beyond what is strictly necessary to devote to exploring and experimenting in architecture. It also takes time for the project to go from a plan to a reality, so that new ideas and innovations have to be sort of incubating for a long time before they actually see the light of day and can be picked up on by others. Then there's the fact that physics dictates form. There are a fixed number of functional ways to enclose space, and you have to work within those options. Three of the core structural forms are arches, buttresses, and columns. And these structures return again and again throughout time because they work. Now, as we'll see today, cultures around the world, independent of one another, developed and used these same structural forms. But the presence of these consistent forms also makes the differences between different buildings and styles all the more apparent and interesting. That is, the things that stay the same make the differences even more clear. We'll be looking at seven sites today and going mostly chronologically. The sites are in different geographic areas and were constructed at various times. And each could easily have a talk devoted just to it. But today we're only concerned specifically with those basic structural elements that enable architecture to exist at all. Arches and the forms that derive from them, buttresses and columns. So we're really just talking about the architectural elements. I'm not going to go into the history of these really incredibly fascinating sites today. And rather than just explaining these different architectural elements in the abstract, we're going to see how they work in real monuments and sites around the world. So to begin, let's go to the ancient city of Mycenae, located about 75 miles southwest of Athens in Greece. Archaeologists named the Greek Bronze Age civilization the Mycenaeans after this site. The Mycenaeans were 
constantly at war with each other. So Mycenae is like all Mycenaean cities, strategically located on a hilltop and fortified with multiple walls. Now, the most famous feature of Mycenae and the first object of our interest is the main city gate through these walls. The gate originally had doors that could be closed and barred, so it wasn't just sitting open like it is today. And on the relief sculpture above the gate, the lion's heads are now missing. They were sculpted on a different piece of stone that's now gone. Uh, but you can see with the artist's reconstruction on the left how it might have originally looked. You'll notice that the stones used here are absolutely massive. Uh, the use of such huge stones is sometimes referred to cy as Cyclopean masonry, because later legends attributed them to the work of mythological one-eyed giants called the Cyclops. These stones were so large that uh, only Cyclops could have uh, been responsible for their construction, was the idea. Now, the gateway is formed using a vaulting technique called post and lintel. Post and lintel is the simplest and earliest of all structure types. It's often used in prehistoric sites like Stonehenge, for example. The two upright posts support a horizontal slab or lintel. A post and lintel construction is very simple. If you need to cover a bigger area, you can set up multiple posts in a row to support additional lintels. You can increase or decrease the height of the posts as needed. But post and lintel has serious limitations. You can increase the distance between the posts a little bit, but to do it too much and the structure becomes unstable. And this is especially true when post and lintel portals are part of a wall or building instead of just being freestanding. Because now there's a heavy load bearing down on the lintel. So how do we deal with this? Well, we introduce a space above the lintel using a technique called corbeling, and now the load is diverted away from the weak center of the lintel and is instead distributed onto the wall on either side of the opening and then down into the ground. Corbeling is done by gradually edging in each row of bricks or stones towards the center a little bit more than the last row. And the gap above is called a relieving triangle because it relieves the lintel from carrying the full load of the wall above. At Mycenae here, the relieving triangle is filled with a carved stone that is much, much, much thinner and thus lighter than the rest of the stones. Because this is a fortified wall, they couldn't just leave it completely empty. But if you were to see this from the side or from the back, you'd see that this relieving stone or the stone that's in the place of the relieving triangle is about like one-fifth the depth of the surrounding st stones. A corbeling can also be used on its own, too, without post and lintel. So if you put a bunch of corbeled arches back-to-back, -back, you can create what's called a corbeled vault. And notice the characteristic triangular shape of the passageway that's formed by the corbeling. Corbeling is also used outside the city walls at Mycenae in the construction of tombs. This tomb is called the Treasury of Atreus. Uh, it was named this by the original archaeologists who were connecting it to the Iliad um, and the characters in it. Um, but it's a really unhelpful name because this is not a treasury and it has nothing to do with anyone named Atreus. But again, we see the combination of post and lintel and corbeling at the tomb entrance. And once again, it would originally have had both doors and a stone blocking up that relieving triangle space. The tomb interior is formed entirely by corbeling, and it creates a beehive-shaped dome. The photo on the right uh, was taken with a fisheye lens to try and capture the space, so it looks a little distorted, but uh, this thing is just so massive that that's the only way you can really get a view of it. So just as the courses of stone were edged in on either side to create the relieving triangle before, here, each ring of stones uh, is brought very slightly closer row by row to the center of the circle until they finally meet at top. Now, you'd think that this thing would be made really structurally unstable by being covered over with earth, but it's actually the opposite. So corbeling, whether it's making an arch or a vault or a dome, it directs a lot of stress outwards. So it really needs a heavy, thick stone, or in this case, a whole mound of dirt to handle that redirected stress. 
We'll leave Mycenae now and turn to a completely different part of the world, to the ruins of the Mayan city of Uxmal in Mexico. The site's highlight is the so-called Pyramid of the Magician. And then just adjacent to it is a square called the Quadrangle of the Birds that is formed by long buildings with open fronts supported by columns. And as you can see, the columns are supporting a corbelled vault. In fact, the Mayans were really crazy about corbeling. There are examples of it used all over not just Uxmal, but other Mayan sites as well. They seem to have known about the semicircular arch, which we'll talk about in a minute, but they just really preferred corbeling. So it's really interesting because here we have a completely different civilization from the Mycenaeans with a completely different architectural style, yet using the same architectural structure or form as the Mycenaeans over 2,000 years later. So basically, both the Mayans and the Mycenaeans arrived at the same solution to the same architectural problem. Now, looking at some of the other architectural elements from Uxmal, you can see that the corbelled arch really matches the aesthetic style very well. There's this tendency towards angularity, towards repeating geometric patterns, towards uh, sh sharp angles and shapes that matches the triangular shape of the corbelled arch quite well, so it's likely that the choice to use corbeling uh, so frequently at Oaksmal was as much a, an aesthetic choice as it was a practical one. Now, of course, there are always, always, always trade-offs in architecture. So corbeling is stronger and more versatile than just post and lintel, but it also requires more effort to construct, so more resources of time and labor and skill have to be devoted to it. And its use is limited to situations where there are thick walls or supports to handle it. Now, possibly the greatest architectural innovation of all time is the true arch. A true arch, unlike a corbelled arch, is able to support itself when complete because of the structural physics at work in it. The stones or bricks that form the arch are called voussoirs, and each voussoir is held in place by the others. They're all perfectly balanced between tension and compression. And if you were to remove the top voussoir, called the keystone, the arch would crumble. By putting multiple arches side by side in a row, we form an arcade. And arcades are really cool because the force produced by each individual arch is balanced by the neighboring arch. So as one pushes out to the left, its neighbor pushes to the right, and each supports the other one. When you extend an arch back into space, increasing its depth, you get something called a barrel vault. And if you spin an arch on its central axis, you create a semispherical dome. Now, arches and their derivative forms form the basis of some of the greatest architectural monuments in the world because they can be combined and adapted to create lots of variations. They're really strong, and they're able to cover large areas without additional support, unlike post and lintel or corbeling. The absolute masters of arches and domes were the Imperial Romans, and one of the greatest demonstrations of their skill is the Pantheon that was built around AD 126 in Rome. The Pantheon was probably built as a temple, and from the front it looks just like any standard Roman temple would. This facade is pretty plain. There's nothing to tell you that there's anything special about this building, which makes the interior all the more stunning because it's so unexpected. Now, the picture on the right shows the front doors. Uh, as people move from the porch through the doors to the interior, you can see how gigantic the building is by comparison. The single room inside is covered with a massive dome that is a perfect hemisphere. So the very top is pierced by a round window called an oculus that illuminates the interior and really draws attention to the sheer size of the dome. The building is designed to fit a perfect sphere. So the distance from the top of the dome to the bottom is 120, excuse me, 142 feet, and it's 142 feet across. It is still, to this day, the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world. And this is one of the most stunning architectural achievements, really, ever. How is it possible? Well, it's thanks to a wonderful invention called concrete. <laughs> 
Now, there's some argument about whether or not the Romans were actually the first to invent concrete, but they were definitely the first to really develop it and use it to any significant degree. People have talked a lot about finding the secret to Roman concrete, but the fact is that the exact recipe varied from place to place. Interestingly, though, although the Romans used concrete all the time, uh, eventually over the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, like the recipe or, was just lost. People didn't use it anymore, and it had to be essentially rediscovered in the modern period. Now, unlike bricks or stones, which exist as multiple separate blocks, concrete is cast as a single whole, so that the different ingredients are all bound together as a unit. The Pantheon's dome was cast layer by layer, doing the bottom ring and then going up another layer and up, working up towards the top. So if we look at a cross section of the dome, you'll notice that the thickness of the dome varies. The dome's base has to handle the most stress, right? So it's going to be the thickest. And then the dome gets thinner and thinner as it moves towards the oculus at the center where you have the unsupported weight. So what's really cool is that not only does it get thinner, and they've varied the, thi varied the thickness, but they've also changed the actual ingredients in the concrete throughout the dome. So at the base, the aggregate, the chunks of brick or stone, are larger and heavier. And then at the top, they used pumice, a volcanic stone that is very porous and very light. On the dome's interior, even more weight was removed by creating these square recesses called coffers. Well, basically, the Pantheon is just one of the coolest things ever. Um, now, moving to the eastern side of the Mediterranean, we'll turn to Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia was designed in AD 537, not by architects, but by two mathematicians, Isidorus of Miletus and Anthemius of Trales. And the building has undergone many modifications and repairs over the years. But the current structure was commissioned by the Byzantine Emperor Justinian to serve as the central cathedral of the Orthodox Church. In terms of design, it's essentially a series of cascading domes and half domes that radiate out from this large central dome. It's kind of like a waterfall or as water cascades down, down rocks. The central architectural problem of Hagia Sophia was how do you put a round top on a square base? A square floor plan was required in order to accommodate the church surfaces, but they wanted the magnificence and the symbolism and the structural properties of a dome. But what are you going to do about these gaps, right? It's not just it's just not going to work unless we come up with some new strategy. And they did. The solution is to basically put a slice of a larger sphere between the round base of the dome and the square walls. So you'll notice that the larger intermediate sphere is actually larger than the square base. So you cut off the excess and are left with pendentives. You can see the pendentives in these interior views of Hagia Sophia, which is such a vast space that is really impossible to capture in one photo. Mastering this transition from round dome down into square piers was a really big deal. But Hagia Sophia's architecture is really remarkable for its reliance on arch technology everywhere throughout the whole structure. There are cascading half and quarter domes, for example, um, but there's also the base of a large central dome. Now, the part of the dome that is subjected to the most stress is the base. That's the part that you want to have the most solid. And yet here it's pierced by windows so that it looks like the dome is actually floating on this layer of light. And this is only possible because the windows themselves are arched. They transfer the stress down to the pendentives, which then send it down further into the four massive piers. Just a few years after Hagia Sophia was completed, but thousands of miles away, a vast temple complex was being created at the Ellora Caves in India. There are actually 34 temples and monasteries at Ellora dedicated to Buddhism, Hinduism, and Jainism, the three major religions native to India. They were created over the course of several centuries, so definitely not all at once, and some are multiple stories tall. This is a really vast complex. As you can see, there are individual towers and structures as well as caves cut into the cliff face. 
But here's the crazy thing about Alora. It is all, the whole thing, even these seemingly independent buildings, carved from the living rock. So all of this space here was created by quarrying and removing bedrock by carving out the stone. In this way, Alora is really not an example of architecture at all. It's actually one massive sculpture. So what do I mean by that? Well, whether you're using mud brick or marble or steel or whatever, architecture is almost always a product of additive processes where disparate materials are gathered together and then assembled into a whole. You're adding things to create the structure. In sculpture, there are additive techniques, and it's usually when you're working with soft materials like clay, you take a piece of the clay and add it to whatever it is you're working on and so forth. And then there are also subtractive processes for working with materials like stone, where you're chipping away, where you're removing elements. So Alora is remarkable not just for its beauty and scale and the temples and chambers themselves, but for the fact that these are architectural shapes, usually made by additive building techniques, that have been produced in a subtractive process. So they've translated architecture into sculpture. For our second to last site, we're going back to Europe and forward in time to the 13th century, the beginning of the Gothic period of architecture. Now, the Gothic was an architectural style that was mostly expressed in churches and cathedrals, and it strove to make buildings that are made from tons and tons of stone seem somehow light and bright and airy. It was like trying to bring heaven into the cathedral space. And this was possible thanks to yet another form of the arch, this time the pointed arch. And you'll notice with comparison to our semicircular arch that was used by the Romans, this one has a pinched top. So it's directing the transferred weight uh, more down and less laterally. And if you cross two arches, whether they're pointed or circular at right angles to each other, it forms what's called a rib vault. Now rib vaults are pretty cool. Um, like the same name suggests, they function as a kind of skeleton, and the ribs do all of the structural work, and so the space between them can actually be filled in with material that isn't able to bear weight, material like stained glass, for example. Now, the thing is, cathedral building in the Gothic period got really competitive. Each city wanted their cathedral to be the best, not just because of civic pride, but because it would attract visitors and help the local economy. So it was actually incredibly important to have a viable cathedral that would attract attention. So the cathedrals became taller and taller, relying on vaults and ex external supports called flying buttresses to keep everything from quite literally falling apart. And the problem with arches is that they tend to want to push outwards. And so the taller or wider the arch becomes, the more necessary it is going to be to have another arch adjacent to it pushing in from either side. And we see that happening here, these buttresses pushing in. Now, when you have an arcade, this isn't a problem. They balance each other out. So this is how we get Beauvais Cathedral. Beauvais has the rather dubious distinction of being the tallest incomplete Gothic cathedral. Cathedrals are constructed from east to west so that the most critical parts are completed first, which means that you can still use the structure while the construction process is still continuing. You get, you know, the functional parts done first. So in 1272, they had completed up to the transept, so up to this cross section here. And then in just 12 years later, part of the choir collapsed, so this area. And they spent the next 63 years reconstructing the collapsed section, adding additional pillars to strengthen it. But work on the cathedral was eventually interrupted by the Hundred Years' War. So when they returned to building, they really decided that it would just be easier financially to add a huge steeple instead. So they did. Um, this is one of the few 
um, images. It's a print, and it's unfortunately not very good quality, but it's one of the only ones we have, um, showing how tall the steeple was, and it was absolutely absurd. In fact, they said, um, we're going to build something so tall that people who see it will think we're crazy. Well, unfortunately, um, the uh, tower, the bell tower, was actually too tall and too heavy for this massive church. And so uh, the cathedral collapsed again during a church service, during a mass. Luckily, um, there was enough warning that everyone was able to get out um, and flee before it collapsed on top of them. There were only two injuries. No one died, thankfully. Uh, And it remains unfinished to this day. Now, what's really kind of amazing about this is that to the left here, this is the Romanesque era church that the cathedral, the Gothic cathedral was meant to replace. And it has survived just fine. (laughs) Whereas the poor Gothic structure here is um, still really unstable. And you can see that they had to finish it essentially by adjoining it to the older structure and then uh, blocking off the open space here to make it usable. Uh, Ironically, during the um, bombings of World War II, um, a lot of the city (laughs) was destroyed. However, the cathedral um, managed to be just fine. Now here we see the beautiful, beautiful interior uh, looking at the choir. Now, although it's easy to kind of Tease Beauvais um, as being, you know, not quite successful. The fact is that what they did finish, what is completed, is absolutely stunning. It's extremely tall, filled with light and color. And it's all thanks to those rib vaults, which you can see here. Right. Now, throughout the cathedral, you can also see the struts and supports that have been added to keep the structure upright. Um, It is really almost constantly under um, examination uh, and attempts to make it more stable uh, and to just conserve the structure. It's a kind of a never-ending process. Now, unfortunately, you know, Beauvais really, when they set out, they really wanted to beat their neighbor, Amiens. Um, and unfortunately, Amiens is still the tallest completed Gothic cathedral. Also, Amiens is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, whereas Beauvais is unfortunately not. Turning now from France to China and moving to this century, 2008 to be exact, we will look at the Beijing National Stadium. It's also nicknamed the Bird's Nest due to its appearance, and it was designed uh, for the 2008 Summer Olympics, and it therefore had to meet a lot of really specific needs. So if we think of architecture as a negotiation between the real and the ideal, right, Uh, this had to not just provide space for sports and spectators, but also uh, meet the Olympic Committee's regulations. Uh, It had to provide ideal space for multiple sports and be able to be used after the Olympics were over. Uh, and needed to withstand an earthquake of 8.0 magnitude and to mitigate its own environmental impact. There were also other practical limitations that happened during construction, like there was a steel shortage that forced the architects to abandon their original idea of a retractable roof. Now, to deal with the earthquake problem, the stadium is actually two separate pieces. There's the concrete stadium bowl with its seating and substructure, and then there's the steel shell that actually sits around it, and they're separated by about 20 feet. Now, this was done to mitigate earthquake damage so that each element can move separately. Now, steel is pretty flexible, but concrete is not, so they also broke the stadium up into nine different sections, and then that way the concrete, too, could flex and uh, move and shift without breaking. After the invention and then rediscovery of concrete, the ability to produce high-quality steel is really the next big leap forward in architecture. And a structure like the Beijing National Stadium would be absolutely impossible without steel. 
It's hard to figure out which parts of the structure are totally load-bearing and which are not. Um, but you can see in this picture of uh, the stadium under construction, it's a little bit simpler. And each, uh, really, it's constructed of a series of sort of transversals of uh, lines that wrap from one side to the other and then move down, uh, channeling the stress into the foundations. So at each of these points of intersection, right angles, uh, the stress and the weight and tension and that each of the beams is being asked to carry is actually distributed to the others. And in some ways, it's not unlike the arches, the rib vaults uh, that we saw earlier, where we have two different supports intersecting at right angles to uh, lend their support to one another. Now, the picture on the top right is not from Beijing National Stadium, um, but it is showing you the types of steel trusses that were used. And you can see that rather than having a horizontal beam and then a vertical section that are connected, it's the steel is actually capable of being bent, of being curved, uh, in order to produce a continuous line of support. Here you can see in the interior uh, where they've added a great deal many more beams. In the top right, it shows you kind of the different stages from the, excuse me, the elements that are strictly necessary on the left uh, to the secondary elements, and then finally the final third layer of elements. The idea was to resemble Chinese ruware pottery, which was extremely popular or and very precious, uh, but only produced during a very narrow period of time. It was valued very much by the emperor at that time. Uh, and it has this characteristic crackling to its glaze. And so while the shape of the stadium suggests a bird's nest, uh, this traditional Chinese pottery uh, pattern was originally the sort of concept behind the exterior's appearance. Now, unfortunately, there's really, although Beijing National Stadium is a really famous site um, and structure, and it's gotten a lot of attention internationally, uh, there's really not a lot of information about the engineering or uh, details of the site. Um, it tends to be rather proprietary. So, um, we unfortunately can't, you know, go into it too much, but Nonetheless, we can see how once you have an advancement in materials, you're able to do a lot more things that would have been impossible with mud brick or marble or um, things like that. So having gone over these seven different sites, we've looked at some of the ways in which each of them uses vaults um, and arches and columns and supports in order to make that structure possible. Now we've gone through them all really, really quickly, and I've simplified a lot of things. So if you are a physicist or an engineer, I apologize because I probably, I mean, I simplified things a lot. But I think that it's fun to think about architecture in this way. It makes you see things a little bit differently, and you're able to look at a building now and look at the different parts and see how it's working together as a whole.